Hey, Shalom, Israel, Brother Rage Jr. here. So today, guys, I'm going to be reading Revelation chapter 12. And the reason why I'm covering Revelation 12 is because you got a lot of brothers that like to make Revelation 12 future. But Revelation 12, brothers and sisters, is not future. I'm going to show you today that Revelation chapter 12 is, in fact, past history. None of these things that we see in Revelation chapter 12 pertain to us. Now, with that being said, because a lot of brothers believe that Revelation 12 is in the future, this is why they usually like to come here to verse 6 to try to say that we're going to some wilderness at the end because, hey, after all, they believe that Revelation chapter 12 is future. But I'm here to show you today that Revelation 12 is not future. That Revelation chapter 12 is in fact past history and with that guys let's go ahead and get into this lesson revelation chapter 12 and i'm going to read verse 1 and it says and there appeared a great wonder in heaven so a great wonder appeared in heaven in john's vision and we're going to see what this wonder is it says a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you the understanding of what you're seeing right here. So John and his vision is basically seeing the 12 tribes of Israel personified as a woman. And we don't have to get bent out of shape and trying to figure out what all of that means. The sun, moon, and the, 12, and the crown of 12 stars. All we have to do is turn over here to Genesis chapter 37 Genesis chapter 37 and our father Jacob he's going to give us the interpretation of what the sun uh, the moon and the stars represent and that'll give that'll allow you to come to the same conclusion that I came to about what all of that represents so Genesis 37 and I'm going to read verse 8 through 10 and it says and his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words, because Jacob has been having dreams concerning himself and concerning his brethren. And in his dreams, his brothers were, it would always end with his brothers uh, bowing to him. And his brothers hated this, especially because they were full of envy because they believed that Jacob, their father, loved him, Joseph, more than the rest of the sons. So they, they hated Joseph for that. OK, but that's not what we're trying to get out of this. We're trying to see what the sun, moon and the stars represent. Verse nine. And it says, and he dreamed yet another dream. And he told it his brother and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun, the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me or bowed to me. So we see that this is the same language that we see in Revelation chapter 12. Now here it says eleven stars instead of twelve. Because Joseph counts as one of these stars. So we're still dealing with 12 stars. Verse 10. And it says, And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father, who is Jacob, rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? So now he's getting, he's going to get ready to give us the interpretation of this sun, moon, and these 12 stars. Okay. And our father Jacob says this. Shall I. Meaning Jacob. Who represents the son. Thy mother. Talking about Rachel. Who represents the moon. And thy brethren. Which represents these 11 stars. But we know it's 12. Because we're including Joseph. Come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth so there you have it 
the sun, moon, 12 stars, it all represents the 12 tribes of Israel. So we know we're dealing with the children of Israel. This is what John is seeing in his vision, except Israel in this vision is being personified as this woman. So back to Revelation 12, and we're going to read verse 2. And it says, And she, being with child, this woman, who is pers who is personified, this woman is simply Israel, she being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now, this imagery we're seeing here is not meant to be literal. Okay, this is just metaphorical. John is seeing this woman, she's pregnant, and she's having uh, labor pains. But again, this is just metaphorical. This is metaphorical for Israel is suffering, okay? They're in pain, and they're being oppressed. That's basically what it's saying. Now, we're going to figure out why Israel is in pain, why they're suffering, why they are oppressed and it's saying pain to be delivered in other words with all this suffering pain and stuff israel is going through they're in need of a savior that's what it's telling you in verse 2 the 12 tribes they're in need of a savior why because they're going through tribulation and we don't have to guess what verse 2 means micah is going to tell us what this means. So let's go to uh, Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Give me just a moment to get there. Micah 5. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Okay. Because it's saying that children of Israel, they need to be delivered. They need a savior. Well, let's see what Micah says. It says, Micah 5, verses 1 through 3. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He have laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Okay, this is Tamat the Messiah. 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, that small city, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. So right here we're seeing prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Prophecy of the coming of Jesus who would be ruler in Israel. Who would save the children of Israel. That he would deliver the children of Israel. It says, Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, letting you know prior to Jesus coming in the flesh as a man, prior to his coming, he was always God. He'd been God from the beginning. So the Bible don't ever want you to forget that. Long before he stepped in the flesh, he was God. Okay, but let's keep going. Verse 3. It says... But prior to his coming, though, it says, therefore, will he, meaning God, give them up. Give who up? The children of Israel. Give them up to what? To sin. And because of the children of Israel sin, it will bring tribulation, great tribulation on them. Because of the evil of their doings, they would now fall under the divine judgment of almighty God, okay? And and what ha what's going to happen? Therefore, he will give them up to what? That divine judgment, which will bring on them tribulation until the time that she, which travaileth, have brought forth. And you see that in verse three, it says the time that she travaileth. So once again, even here, Israel's being personified as this same woman in Revelation chapter 12. It's the same language, brothers and sisters. So even here, it uses a metaphor. The time which she, the, um, the time that she which travaileth have brought forth, brought forth who? Jesus, the Messiah. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Because with Christ, with 
come salvation. With Christ would come deliverance. Now, on that front, this is going to lead us to Isaiah 53 concerning Jesus saving Israel. We're going to see something. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. And it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, verse 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant, who is Jesus, justify many for he shall bear their iniquity. So Israel was in need of a deliverer, a savior, and that one was in fact Christ. However, it was prophesied first that Jesus would come to suffer. It was prophesied that Jesus would come to be that sin offering. And in being that sin offering, he would save Israel. Physically, no. He would first save Israel from themselves. He would save them from their sins, atoning for them. So, yes, he did come. And he saved Israel, but he saved Israel spiritually first. But Israel, that's not all. They still, Israel still needs to be delivered. Deliver how? Israel still needs to be delivered physically. From who? All of their enemies. Because it was that very sin in which Christ saved them from that brought these nations on them. And so now Israel is waiting to be delivered from their enemies. Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, Lord, when are you going to save us physically? But when Christ came, he did not come to do that at that time. He came to fulfill everything that was written about him coming and suffering and being the sin offering for Israel, thus saving them spiritually. But the physical part is going to come later. OK, so now we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 12 and we're going to continue reading. We are going to read verse three. OK, and it says, and there appear another wonder in heaven. So now John, he's seeing a vision and he's seeing something else in heaven. It says, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads now this dragon i'm just going to go ahead and give you understanding this dragon yes it's satan but it's also these nations being personified as a dragon just how israel was personified as this woman where here we got these nations who's oppressing Israel. They're being personified as this dragon. And we know the dragon is Satan because this dragon uses these nations. Let's go skip down a little bit to Revelation 12. And I'm going to read verse 9. So that way we're not guessing. It says, and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil in Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. OK, so there we have it. We know who this dragon is. This dragon is Satan. But not only that, this dragon is just simply being personified. This dragon is nothing more than just the nations. Right. Verse four. OK, let's keep on reading. And it says, John saw some. It says, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman 
which was ready to be what? Delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And who is this child to be born? This child that would be ruler in Israel. This child was Christ. So we see here that this dragon was trying to devour Jesus as soon as it was born. As soon as it was born. And as a result of trying to devour this child, we know that this dragon wasn't able to devour this child. But in trying to devour this child, this dragon drew a third part of these stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And I'm going to show you that these stars is nothing more than the children of Israel. But we're going to get even more specific of who of the children of Israel. So let's go ahead and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2, brothers and sisters. And if you can, write these scriptures down to better help you in your own personal studies, because I expect you all to break down Revelation 12 on your own. So now Matthew chapter 2, because we need to see who these stars that was cast down as a result of this dragon trying to devour this child being Jesus. Let's take a look. Matthew 2 and 1. And then I'm going to read verse 12 through 16. And it says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, notice it didn't say three wise men. It said wise men. Okay. Now, let's skip down to verse 12. And it says, And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed out of their own country another way. Because remember, Herod was inquiring of where Christ was going to be born because he claimed that he wanted to go worship this child or whatnot, but we know that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill Jesus, this one that was to be king of the Jews. So let's keep reading verse 13. And when they were departed, when these wise men departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Okay? And Herod is being her basically um this dragon is working through Herod to what devour this child who is what Jesus so verse 14 when he arose meaning Joseph he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt why because this dragon okay but we know the dragon can't do nothing. This dragon has to use somebody. It's got to use the nations. And who's the dragon using at this time? This dragon is using Herod to try to devour this child that Israel is bringing forth. 15, and it says, And was there, so Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they were there in Egypt unto the death of Herod. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son, which is, um, you can find that in the book of Hosea. Okay, verse 16, and it says, Then Herod, in which this dragon is working through, he's working through Herod. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew. Okay, now we finna see who these stars are that was cast down to the earth, meaning were killed. And slew all the children that were in what? Bethlehem and in all the coasts, meaning all the edges of Bethlehem. From two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So we see these stars 
that this dragon in which is using Herod, which was cast to the earth, we see that it's these children in Bethlehem, these Israelites, that was two years old and under. Think about that. In all Bethlehem, in all of Bethlehem, and the edges thereof. So a third part of them children were killed. Which God says is the stars of heaven. Very, very, very sad day, brothers and sisters. Um, no other nation has been through this. These things that we've been through. And that, that was very, very unfortunate. But it had to happen, brothers and sisters. You know, because it was prophecy. So, that's just the way it is. Okay, so we see who them stars were. Now, let's continue reading. Verse 5, and it says, And she, meaning the uh, Israel, brought forth a man-child, meaning Jesus, who was to rule all nations with what? A rod of iron. Okay, and that's not happening right now. But he's to rule all nations with the rod of iron. So we know we're still dealing with Jesus. And it says, Her child, so Israel's child, who is Jesus, was caught up unto God and to his throne. And now we're going to go and see what that means. He was caught up unto God and to his throne. Let's go see what that means. Let, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Because the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us what this means. Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, that's that child, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so this Jesus, this one who was to be ruler in Israel, that will rule the nations with a rod of iron. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, ah, despising the shame, and is set down at what? The right hand of the throne of God. Remember, because it said the child was called up to the throne. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God or the Father. Because Jesus, let's go back to Revelation 12, because it was prophesied that Jesus, again, would be the sin offering for Christ. He would be the one making the atonement. And so for that to happen, Jesus had to die. And he died by the, by the hands of the Romans. But never forget, he was given over by the children of Israel. OK, so essentially he was murdered by Israel. And he was called up to uh, God and to his throne. And we've seen that he went up. And that's the last that we ever saw him. Okay. Now, with that being said, brothers and sisters, we're going to read verse 6. Because something is going to happen as a result of Jesus' death. Okay. Because Israel has now murdered their Messiah. So now something is going to happen as an effect. Of that cause. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Where she have a place prepared of God. That they should feed her there. A thousand. Two hundred. And three score days. And that verse 6. Was prophecy of what would happen. After Jesus death. We, we do not have to guess what this verse 6 means. It is it future? No, it's not future, brothers and sisters, because it was prophesied that this verse 6 would happen after the murdering of the Messiah. And where can we find that? Well, let's go to the book of Daniel. Let's go to Daniel 9. Daniel 9 in verse 26, and it says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And what does that mean? Him being cut off? Hey, that's the same as reading this Revelation 12 and 5. 
and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. That's the same as this right here. Messiah would be cut off, murdered by his people, okay, and caught up to uh, God into the throne. It says, but not for himself. Yeah, not for himself. Why? Because it was prophesied that Jesus would be the sin offering for the children of Israel. He would be that lamb. He would be that Passover, which is the lamb. OK, so he had to die. But nevertheless, Israel still killed him. That was a great sin that they committed. And after they did this, there was no more hope for Israel. And it says, and the people of the prince. So. As a result of Christ's death, what happens? And the people of the prince, who's the prince? This prince is Satan, the dragon. The people of the prince shall come. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. What's the city? Jerusalem. And what? The sanctuary. What's the sanctuary? That great big old temple that Israel worshipped more than they worshipped God. And it says, in the end there of shall be with what a flood because remember this army and i'm just going to say it this roman army that would come in remember they wouldn't just bust in to jerusalem right away and start the killing and the burning down no they would siege jerusalem first but at the end of that siege what the invasion they would come in and they would massacre and kill so many Israelites, it would make your head spin. Okay, and then they would burn everything down. And it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So, with, as a result of Israel murdering their Messiah and Christ being called up to the throne of God, this woman would be in deep, deep trouble, deep trouble under the divine judgment of God because God would send the people of the prince to destroy Jerusalem. Just as he did in days of old, Christ, you know, Israel did evil. He sent the nations on them to destroy them. Well, it's no different here. After they commit their final evil, which is murdering the Messiah, the Lord would send these armies to come in and utterly destroy Jerusalem. And this is why we see right after Jesus being called up to the throne, we see in verse six, we see this woman who was Israel running to this wilderness. Why? Because of those armies. But don't worry, brothers and sisters. We're going to keep um, looking at some more scriptures. We're going to go to the uh, the book of Luke. Because, in fact, Jesus... um prophesies of this revelation 12 and 6 he he literally told us what would happen when he's called up to the throne of god luke chapter 21 okay and i'm going to read verses 20 through 22 because jesus himself is going to say what is going to happen to him when he's after he dies after his death it says and when ye shall see jerusalem compassed with armies that roman army he says then know that the desolation thereof is not so when you see this roman army besiege jerusalem you know the end of jerusalem and the temple is near okay verse 21 now jesus is going to give the command then let them which are in judea Okay, flee into the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let them that are not in the countries, meaning the other Israelites that come that like to come and visit. Don't let them enter there into. Why? Because this Roman army is going to get ready to destroy Jerusalem and this temple, this would be the end of the kingdom of Judah, the end of Israel. OK, and from there, of course, we would be scattered to the end of time until Christ's return. But nevertheless, the Lord told um, those that be in Judea, flee to the mountains. 
What does he mean when he says the mountains? When he says mountains, he's literally telling them to flee to the wilderness. Why? Because where those mountains are is where the wilderness is. So let's just uh, take a look, for example, just so y'all know I'm not blowing smoke. I'm going to show you that these mountains, that the wilderness is where these mountains are. That's why he told um, the children of Israel, flee to the mountains. But specifically those that were in Judea. Let's go to 1 Samuel. And we're going to read chapter 23. And that's the thing I love about this Bible, brothers and sisters. You don't have to guess. All the answers that you're looking for is in this book. 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 14. And it says, And David abode in the wilderness, in strongholds. So it says David abode in the wilderness, in strongholds. And remained in a what? A mountain. In a what? In a mountain. In the wilderness. In the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. So we see here that this wilderness of Ziph was right where this mountain was. Let's go to Numbers 3. Just give you guys another example. Just trying to show you that Jesus, in fact, commanded them to go to this wilderness. He's commanding this woman, when you see these armies come past Jerusalem, run to these mountains or run to the wilderness. Numbers chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1, and then I'm going to read verse 4. Let me see. Yeah, Numbers 3, and then I'm going to read verse 14, excuse me. And it says, These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. Let's skip down to verse 14. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of what? Sinai. And remember, verse 1. When he spoke with Moses in Mount Sinai. But where are they though? In the wilderness of Sinai. Why? Because where this mountain is, that's where that wilderness is. So Jesus literally told them to flee to the wilderness. All right. So now let's go back to Revelation 12 and 6. So when you're looking in Revelation 12 and 6, it says this woman fled to the wilderness. And it says she should... Uh, feed uh, there for a thousand two hundred and three score days. Those days don't have nothing to do with us. Those are the days that they would, uh, the children of Israel who escaped out of Judea and stuff would be in this wilderness because during those days, during that a thousand two hundred and three score days, this Roman army would be over there besieging Jerusalem and eventually destroying them. OK, and because remember, the Lord told these inhabitants, listen, don't take nothing. When you see these this Roman army, you need to run. And that's what happened. And so they don't have anything. Therefore, they have to be taken care of. And who is going to take care of them? God, because God always makes sure that a remnant escapes. Because make no mistake, the people of the prince. They wanted to destroy each and every Israelite that was there. But like I said, a remnant always escapes because the Lord makes sure of it. Now, we've completed that. Now we can read verses 7 through 9. So Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 7 through 9. Actually, we're going to read verses 7 through 9. 11 and it says and there was war in heaven so now we're um kind of going to backtrack in time a little bit but we're going to also see the things that are happening beyond the earthly realm we're going to see things take place in the spiritual realm because the things that happen in the spiritual realm manifest itself in the physical realm because there are things that take place spiritually in the spiritual realm, then it manifests, okay? 
But let's see, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels. And why was there war in heaven? Because Jesus has completed his mission. The mission of what? Dying for Israel, being that sin offering, being that atonement that Israel needed. He saved them from sin. And so a war broke out. Michael and his angels, they fought against the dragon who is Satan. And the dragon who is Satan fought in his angels. But what? And prevailed not. So Satan could not prevail. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And we're going to get to all that. I got the scripture that we can look at. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. Okay. Called the devil and Satan. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him now this verse 9 i'm gonna let you know this is also cause and effect he was kicked out and as a result of him being kicked out something is going to happen but we're going to get to that verse 10 and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and what the kingdom of our god and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Okay. Which accused them before our God day and night. And you can go read that in Job 1. How Satan always accusing the children of Israel. Okay. Verse 11. And it says. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb meaning the saints they overcame satan by what the blood of the lamb and by the word of their what testimony which was of this lamb of jesus and they loved not their lives unto death and all of that that we just re read let's see what all of that meant let's go to first john chapter three and I'm going to read verses 8 through 10. Okay. And it says. He that committeth sin is of the devil. That's right. That's your father. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose. The son of God was what manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. So, as a result of Jesus becoming that sin offering, dying from Israel, and being called up to that throne. Now, Jesus has completed his mission. And now, what did we just witness? The works of the devil has now been destroyed. And that's why that war broke out. Because Satan no longer, no longer has a place in heaven because his works have been what destroyed and we're going to see to verse 9 it says now that his works have been destroyed whosoever is born of god or of jesus doeth not sin right for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god in this, the children of God are made manifest, are brought to the light. Because prior to Christ, all Israel, we all fell under sin. So no matter what we did, no difference was made. Okay, we were all seen in the eyes of God as evil, as being wicked. We were all seen the same. And, Christ, and, and Satan stayed in heaven pointing that out to God about us. But now that Jesus has come, now a difference is being made. Now it says in this, the children of God are made manifest and the children of the devil. It says, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So now those that came up under Christ, Christ now makes those brothers and those sisters perfect. Now they're separated 
from the children of darkness, the children of Satan. OK, now uh, that difference is made because Christ has completed his miss mission. In that verse 11, it says, and they overcame him, these saints that overcame the devil by the blood. They haven't completely overcome right now, but they're going to overcome what? When Jesus returns and he resurrects them. They will have officially overcome. OK, so I'm going to keep reading by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. Why? Because who are they being persecuted by, jailed by and murdered by the children of Satan? Because Satan was operating through these wicked and disobedient Israelites. That war was raging. OK. Now we've did that. Now we can read. Revelation 12, and I'm going to read verse 13 and 14, and it says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Because uh, Michael and his angels, they kick Satan out. He no longer has a place in heaven. He will no longer be among the sons of God. Or he is no longer, I should say, among the sons of God when they present themselves to the Most High. He's no longer among them. He's been kicked to the earth says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. And who's in this earth? The children of Israel. It says, for the devil is come down unto you. It says, what? Having great wrath. He's in a rage because he knoweth that he have but a short time. Because now that Jesus has completed his mission, Satan knows the only thing left for Jesus to do now is to come back down and destroy him. Because really, that's all that's left for Jesus to do now. Deliver Israel from their enemies, their physical enemies. Deliver them physically. And to what? Destroy Satan. And that's what's going to happen, brothers and sisters. Say it, Christ is going to come back, right? He's going to deliver us from the nations. He's going to reign a thousand years. And during those a thousand years, he's going to have Satan locked up. And once those a thousand years have ended, guess what? He's going to throw Satan in the lake of fire. And Satan knows this. He knows now that he has but a short time. Okay, and let's keep reading verse 13. It says, and when the dragon, Satan, saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Because remember, it, it tells you on um, the people of the prince, they would come and they would destroy the city and the sanctuary, Jerusalem and the temple. OK, so we see that this dragon is using these nations, specifically Rome to persecute this woman which brought forth the man child okay and by persecuting means bringing this army in to the destroy them because like i told you things happen in the spiritual realm that we don't see which manifests in the physical realm okay so what the bible basically was giving us with that war in heaven it was basically the bible was giving us a uh, insight of what was going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. So now we're going back to this woman being uh, persecuted. OK, it says he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. OK, and we're going to figure out in what way did he persecute this woman? Verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. So this is the same thing that we read in verse four. But we're looking, we're getting a different perspective in verse 14. It says this woman was given two wings of a great eagle. OK, Christ is taking care of her. God is taking care of her. That's what I mean, that she might fly into the wilderness, her this place of safety, because this army is on the scene. It says into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, which is the same in that verse four. Um, not verse four, that verse six, 
yeah, verse six, where it says, um, she would feed there a, a thousand two hundred and three score days. Why? Because during that time, the prince, the people of the prince would be there besieging the city and eventually destroying it. That's why it says she would be there where she is nourished for a time, times, have a time from who? The face of the serp serpent. But I thought it was the people of the prince, Daniel. No, it is the people of the prince. But who is using these people? This serpent, this snake, Satan. He is the one attacking and persecuting this woman. Okay, verse 15. So now we're going to see uh, why this woman was given the, the wings of a great eagle. Okay, and why she has to be nourished for a time, time and a half a time. Okay, why she's flying into this wilderness. 15. It says the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. Okay, and this water is these um, invading armies of Rome said, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood because he attempted to completely wipe out everyone that was in Jerusalem. All of those Israelites, he wanted to wipe them all out. But as we seen in verse 14, as well as verse 6, we see that God made sure a remnant would escape that onslaught by that Roman army. He made sure of it. Okay. Verse 16, it says, and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. In other words, God helped the children of Israel, just like he did in Exodus when Israel was fleeing and um, from the Egyptians, the earth helped the woman, them, them, uh, the sea split and all of that stuff right there. But it was never about the sea. The point was, was that God was aiding this woman, helping them escape. And that's what we're witnessing right here, because Satan seek to completely sift them. But God made sure that remnant escaped. Verse 17, and it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman because he wasn't able to get all of them. Crap. Some of them escaped. That remnant escaped. And it says, And what in this part, now this applies to us. None of that other stuff applies to us, but this applies to us. It says, And this dragon went to make war with the remnant of what her seed of this woman's seed, but what remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So Satan went to make war with us, the righteous seed. That's who he is after. And that's who he's going to be after all the way to the end until Christ's return. And that's all I got for you, brothers and sisters. I hope you guys got a good, thorough understanding of Revelation 12. And I will see you guys in another video. Shalom.